Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, lawmakers talk about efforts to provide free menstrual products in schools, to require civics and personal finance for graduation, and to add cultural hairstyles to the Minnesota Human Rights Act, plus the latest Senate actions and a move to sanction Russia. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. In the same way that schools provide free toilet paper and soap to students, efforts are underway around the country to make menstrual hygiene products available to people who have periods for free as well. Senator Steve Swadzinski, a former teacher, has proposed a bill to do just that. He's also proposing bills to ensure high school graduates receive instruction in personal finance and civics. He joins me now to talk about these legislative efforts. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I must confess that I was a little bit amused, but also very appreciative of your willingness to take on the topic of period poverty. You presented this in the Education Committee last week. Menstruation is not a topic very many men are willing to discuss, and yet it is a topic that half of the population must deal with. So how did this bill come to you? Oh, man. Um, and thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, so about three years ago, pre-COVID, um, th three women from the U, young women, and three students from um, a school district in my district, a school in my district, met with me and just wanted to talk about this issue. And everybody at this meeting, because there were other members there too, um, were all women except for myself. And it was awkward and uncomfortable. And yet I listened and I'm kind of like just perplexed that, as you said, you know, we provide toilet paper, we provide paper towels, we provide soap products, and yet we don't provide feminine hygiene products. And so it planted a seed in my head. And so I ended up talking to the school nurses in my district and they had all wonderful anecdotes of why this is necessary. I talked to teachers that said we, I keep a few in my desk drawer. I, I mean, I just had no idea how needed this bill was and the uncomfortableness of being a seventh grade girl or sixth grade girl and for the first time and having to, anyways, um, that's how the whole thing started and it just has steamrolled since then. And, and you, you sort of previewed my next question a little bit because uh, women who've been through this, you know, it, it's a great equalizer. You'll ask a stranger anywhere, in a bathroom, whatever, when you're in need. But if you are a young girl and this is new to you, it can be so embarrassing. So since this bill came to you, I know you mentioned you talked to your wife and your daughter and so many other women now have come forward with stories of their embarrassing moments. This has been a bit of a wake up, or I shouldn't say wake up call, aha moment maybe. Uh, a wake up call and aha moment for me big time, especially hearing my wife's anecdotes from when she was a young girl that I, we've known each other for 40 years and I never knew this. And I'm sure every man out there, I don't know how anybody can be opposed to this bill um, because it just, it just talk to your wives, talk to your daughters, talk to your moms and you're gonna go, okay mom, I guess I, I'll vote for this bill. And uh, it's, so it's, it's just, and like, so I, went, I was at Eden Prairie High School a couple of weeks ago and I was just happened to t talk to the school nurse again because I kept her in the loop over the last couple of years and she's like just get this done just get this done it's necessary and she told me how Eden Prairie does it and and I was walking th through the hallways back to my old department and I happened to see a secretary that I adore I haven't seen her in a couple of years and I just went in and said what I'm working on and she goes last week I had to give a student uh, my sweater to cover up um, mm -hmm. uh, um, some bleeding through her clothes and, um, and and that happens all the time stories anecdotes like that and that just happened to a secretary at this high school. Now I mentioned the phrase period poverty because that is what um, journalists and others are calling this this movement because it's also an equity issue. There are people who cannot afford these products. They're not cheap and miss educational opportunities. Stay home from school. Uh, their lives are impacted because they can't afford the means to kind of, you know, keep keep things neat and tidy throughout the day. So this is also an equity issue, correct? Yes, big time. And because it, I mean, 50% of the population has this monthly, um, a bed. And uh, happening? Happening. <laughs> well, that's back to our earlier conversation of um, 60s um, music and um, like, anyways, so um, 
Uh, yeah, it, and then, so to find out, and it's a bigger piece of the puzzle than even just equity, um, than normalcy for 50%, normalcy is not the right word, but just equity, and just to find out, like you said, girls missing school because they can't afford um, period products. And then I found out that SNAP programs doesn't, you can't use your SNAP fund money for, for period products, and that's just crazy that we're penalizing young girls for being young girls and then double penalizing them if they happen to be, um, you know, uh, not being able to afford these products. And it's, it's just the right thing to do for, for everybody. Now let's turn to your wheelhouse and, and I'll, I'll get you off the hot seat here. Uh, because you have also presented legislation that would ensure civics for 11th and 12th graders as a graduation requirement and also a course in personal finance as a high school graduation requirement. Let's talk about civics, your wheelhouse. Why 11th and 12th grade? Why do they need this? Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Um, first of all, it's not required to graduate in any school. A government standalone class, civics, whatever you want to call it, it's not required to graduate in Minnesota. Um, the standards, you can embed in wherever you can fit them, but a standalone government class is not required. Um, three of my school districts, I represent three school districts, only one requires it to graduate. And, um, and it's Eden Prairie, and it's because back in 2001, after being the government teacher for 15 years, I'm like, kids are graduating without this class. It was an elective. And I fought for it, um, and we got it passed in locally in, within Eden Prairie. And, um, and so, but, and some school districts required in ninth grade, in Eden Prairie, it's 11th or 12th grade, you have to have it then. And the reason I want it then is because that's when kids are signing up for selective service. That's when they're paying their first gas taxes. That's when they look at their payroll check for the first time and go, oh my God, I have to, what are these T-A-X-E-S, if I just spelled it right, that on my, on my pay stub. And, and they're starting to, you know, go out on dates and realize that they're, it, what, you know, all these taxes. And the, the 17th um, grievance in the Declaration in the, of independence says um, the reason we're fighting a war against the king is for taxation taxation without representation and so 16 and 17 year olds are being taxed without rep being represented and um, so I a I think it's wrong on that level and B it's they just need this class and they're screaming for it and ninth grade is just too young I don't think because they haven't had those experiences yet with their paycheck and signing up for selective service and all these things a, a fledging adult has to do so uh, I, I, I get pretty passionate about that class being required to graduate and right now the language we um, passed I think three years ago um, we got the language in this in the in the statute now it says encouraged in 11th and 12th grade but so, you would like it to be mandatory yeah, across the state yeah. and the opposition and it's fair um, some of my opponents say it's um it's an unfunded mandate upon the schools and if a school district wants to do it like Eden Prairie did um, they, they have the right to do it but to, for the state to be mandating um, you know what classes you should teach and to me that falls on false ears at least to me well you also have a bill that would um, require a course in personal finance and I think that both government and personal finances are much more complicated issues now than when I came of age. But how did the how did this idea come to you, and and what's the rationale, um, kind of succinctly, if you can, for having kids? have a course in personal finance to graduate. Yeah, well, like the period poverty bill, I mean, this is Civics 101. I mean, I didn't think of these things myself. I wished I had, but the bill came to me through, you know, just meeting your elected officials. And so I was, um, I met this woman that was complaining to me that her kid is saddled with college debt and all these things. And I don't know why he didn't have to have a personal finance class when they were in high school. And I'm listening to this um, woman and I'm like, oh my God, because when we we were kids, you saw your parents fighting over the kitchen table once or twice a month and bills piled up and checks being written and kids don't see that anymore because everything's done online. So now more than ever, um, the kids need to have a personal finance class, again, 11th or 12th grade because if we require a class like that in 9th grade, the kids aren't going to take it. Maybe some will, but not all because they just don't have that experience yet of, oh my God, I, I have to start setting aside money for college and, and um, you know, all these 
it's kids of God, they're like 24, 25, and they're graduating with all this debt. And it, I, I think it, they may have, may have made better decisions had they known um, in high school um, about things like being saddled with college debt the rest of, for the next 20 years of your life. And so anyways. Yes, well, we'll follow these bills as they hopefully move through the system. And Senator Steve Swodzinski, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Shannon, for having me. And I greatly appreciate this honor. On a vote of 42 to 24, the Senate passed a measure that would extend Minnesota's health care premium security plan, also known as reinsurance, for another five years. Uh, this bill was originally passed and implemented in 2018. Originally, we applied for a two-year waiver, and the federal government uh, didn't issue two-year waivers. They issued five-year waivers. So this year, back in special session this past summer, we uh, directed the Department of Commerce to apply for another five-year waiver. They did get that application in. That application was in timely. And so uh, we did get notice that there are some things that need to still need to be completed in order to get the actual waiver. One of those things that needs to be completed is we need to show that we're serious about having reinsurance, and so we have to pass a bill showing that we're setting up reinsurance for the future. The way the bill is structured before us today pays for the entire cost of the program up front in the first year, over a billion dollars of taxpayer money in the first year, again, going directly to fund our private insurance plans. They set the rates, they set the amount, they set their executive compensation, and every one of the, as far as I know, every one of the insurance companies that's getting our money here has CEOs paid in the well over a million dollar range. They set the profits, their, their income there, based on what the claims are going to be, and then we're going to reinsure the insurance companies, which gets to the bottom line problem that we have a system where they tell us how much they, they're going to pay, how much they're going to charge for it, they set the premiums, and then we give them money, and oh, we hope you'll bring it down. This bill is to help provide stability and access to a market that doesn't have flexibility and can't dictate prices. So ladies and gentlemen, let's make sure that our entrepreneurs and those who buy in the individual market still have access to affordable health insurance. And with unanimous approval, the Senate passed a bill that would direct the legislative auditor to audit the Southwest Light Rail Transit project. We now know that an additional $700 million or so will be required of Hennepin County bringing the project up to $2.75 billion. And the project will be delayed for another three or four years. And since then, we have seen that some large condo towers that are adjacent to this construction project, as well as a warehouse, have experienced cracking and flooding. I'll just note parenthetically, Mr. President, these were some impacts that were forewarned and disregarded by the Met Council. I know that because I was a part of the effort to forewarn the Met Council that those condo towers were probably at risk. I think it's the largest, I should say most expensive, not largest, the most expensive public works project in the history of the state of Minnesota, over 14 miles, 14 and a half miles of light rail. This is, what, what's occurred here in my mind is just literally criminal as to how badly the taxpayers, be they federal or state or county taxpayers, how badly they are being treated by the Met Council on this project. They claim that it is a generational investment, but if we do not get this project back on track, it will be a generational investment and that my children's children will be paying for it. This audit is needed to get answers for future development, for future um, transit projects that are coming down the line. The tool we have is the legislative auditor um, who can really get in there, look at the record, consult expertise, uh, find out the facts, view all the communications, um, really find out what's going on and report to us in great detail. The 
Minnesota Human Rights Act was enacted in 1967 to protect the civil rights of Minnesotans and prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, religion, and disability in employment, housing, and education. Senator Bobby Joe Champion is the Senate author of a bill that would add hair texture and style within the category of race, and I spoke with him this week. The bill is called the Crown Act, which stands for creating a respectful and open world of natural hair. Why does hair need a special mention? You know, thank you so much for having me on. And I always uh, count it a, a privilege to come on your show and discuss these important policy uh, initiatives with you. To your question, it, it requires a special mention because we've seen nationally, not just in the state of Minnesota, the need to make sure that we create an open and respectful workplace and also school, right? You know, we've seen some issues in school where individuals who, pref who prefer uh, to wear their natural hair are sometimes ostracized or they're made to feel as if their cultural expression or their natural being uh, is not a preferred um, uh, look, right? And so um, by making sure that we have this, uh, uh, policy in place just reassures them that we care, that the state of Minnesota care, and we want employers and, and school um, educators and others to know that we care. So we want to create that space in a respectful way to be as, in, as, in, as inclusive and as accepting of others. Now, I'm sure you've heard from people who have experienced this kind of discrimination. Can you provide one or two brief examples? You know, absolutely. Remember, in 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 2018, not here in the city of uh, uh, in the state of Minnesota, but across the country, there was a wrestler who was going for a championship or involved in a wrestling match. He had um, dreads um, in his hair, uh, and the referee told him that if he did not cut his dreads off, he could not wrestle. So he would have to end up forfeiting, even though his hair length was the same if not shorter than some of his other classmates or other colleagues or other teammates, he was forced right at that moment on the side of the mat to cut his hair. I know another example. In fact, when I was on WCCO, Jerlyn Steele um, also mentioned a situation that happened with one of her relatives where they had braids and, and there was some reluctance or pushback uh, around that. And so um, those are just two situations. I can go on and on and on to show that it has happened in so many settings where nationally now different states are saying and recognizing that we need to do something about it. So in fact, there's 17, I think it's 17 other states that, that has adopted the Crown Act or some, you know, um, similarity to it or something similar to it. So how will having hair and hairstyles spelled out within the framework of Minnesota's Human Rights Act help those claiming a violation of their rights? Number one, the, the biggest thing that I think that the Human Rights uh, Office does is with employers and others, teach. Teach about and talk about the importance of acceptance and, and culture and hair. This is not about penalizing someone, we try to alleviate that. So the, the ability for uh, businesses and others to be educated about this issue will help them understand that perhaps they might have a blind spot, right? And so um, I think by spelling it out makes it clear. It, 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 it doesn't leave, um, uh, you, you know, this whole notion of people not understanding. Clarity is good for the soul, I often say, right? So I'd rather be certain than, than cautious. I'd rather be clear than, 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 than fumbling. So I think it just provides clarity and it will allow the employers to understand the uh, folks who are on the other side of the equation also feel like they're valued as well. Now, I understand that the primary focus here is natural hair and cultural hairstyles, but I wonder, does it expend, extend to all hairstyles? For example, my daughter, wanted to dye her hair purple and she's young and it's fun and she did but i was concerned when she asked about the ramifications with teachers or peers you know and she's a child but if she were out looking for her first job would somebody not hire her because they have decided that purple hair is not appropriate does this extend then to all hairstyles you know one of the, so the, the the short answer is no <laughs> is that this is really for 
around culture, right? Who you are, who you were born with. It's sort of like if you were born with blue eyes, we would not want someone to discriminate against another person just because they have blue eyes, right? That's something that's natural and they should be able to express themselves and not have to wear contacts in order to be accepted. So it's cultural and natural. Secondly, oh, I don't believe that hair color is cultural. You know, although I believe that people should have the freedom to wear their hair any color that they want, right? Um, and not be judged, but to be judged on their skills and qualifications. So to me, that's important. Here's the other thing that I'm also asked. Well, what if a person's hair length interferes with safety in some shape, form, or fashion? Does it protect that? No, because if you have a policy that is for everyone, right, you know, then that's different than allowing, let's say, my white peer to wear long hair and is straight, but you won't allow me to wear long hair because I have dreads or I have some natural hairstyle. So I think we're getting to that as opposed to complicating this matter. But it's really about even in the state of Minnesota, when we think in terms of employers and others that come to our great state, I want people to be judged on their skills and qualifications because we need to diversify our businesses. Just think in terms of the footprint and where we are going as a state and how we want to remain globally competitive. This is just a good business decision as well. So if you're one of those individuals who says, hey, I'm having business shortages, worker shortages, I want to make sure whether we have 3M or, or Juno Mills or Target or some other place, and we want to attract and retain good talent, this is the way to do that, is to create a, a, an environment that's welcoming and diverse. So I wouldn't want your daughter to be judged on, on the fact that she decided to uh, get her hair colored. Like if I decided to color my hair blonde, <laughs> I, I should be able to do that, right? <laughs> So this house, uh, this bill did pass the house on uh, a vote of 104 to 25, which so it had great bipartisan support. Will you get a hearing in the Senate? You know, that's a hundred thousand dollar question. But let me tell you, uh, I'm doing everything within my power to get a hearing in the Senate. I've had some discussions already with Senator uh, uh, Matthews, who chairs the civil law division, which uh, which oversees the Department of Human Rights. And so this bill would would uh, be under their jurisdiction. Um, I provided for him background information to talk about how this has, has come to be and why it's so necessary. Um, I've also had some discussions with Senator Jeremy, Jeremy Miller, uh, who is the Senate Majority Leader to talk about this as well, as well as other colleagues, anyone and everyone who I think will listen from Julie Rosen to Senator Benson to uh, Senator Housley, because it may not be something that they face every single day, but there are members of my community that does. And my sharing of that should be welcomed and understood. And we should be given a platform to further enlighten not only just the chair, but the rest of the committee and create a space for uh, inclusion to be a part of our, 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 uh, um, our fabric, the, the fabric of Minnesota. Now, I only have about a minute left, but I, I want to ask you this one question, um, and hopefully we can go into it in more depth another time. But you are the chief Senate author of a bill called the African American Family Preservation Act, which was introduced last session and still awaits a hearing. Can you just provide a brief overview of what this bill seeks to do? This bill seeks to preserve families, African-American families, by not letting a system that is broken, better known as child protection or child welfare, to interfere in a way that is, that is biased, right? So we have seen, and it's well recorded, that Black children are much more easily removed from their households. And even when it comes to uh, a removal and placing that child with a, 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 a member of their family or, or kinship, uh, that doesn't happen for various reasons, uh, because some of the policies are very biased and, and, and seeks to exclude participation as opposed to include participation. So it just really seeks to say, how do we write this system in such a way that is fair and that we can make sure that we value family? Why? Because when, when there's a healthy, intact family, kids have better outcomes, families have better outcomes, and that's a benefit for Minnesotans. So that's what we really seek to do is make sure that we create an opportunity for African-American families to stay together and, and remove those barriers that we know empirically has, has been problematic. Senator Bobby Joe Champion, it's so nice to see you and thank you for your time. 
it's so good to see you. And thank you again. Thank you to the uh, listening audience. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Members of the Senate Local Government Committee grappled with a bill that would nullify the rent control initiatives approved by voters in Minneapolis and St. Paul last November. Senate File 3414 members uh, prohibits the local government from enacting rent control policies on private residential properties. This bill is retroactive to November 1st of 2021, which would have the effect of nullifying the votes in St. Paul and Minneapolis to enact or pursue rent control. Rent control is not the answer to our housing challenges. We need more housing and more types of housing to meet demand. This policy has taken Minnesota off the national map for housing investment. This lack of investment when the population of St. Paul is growing faster than new housing availability is problematic and will worsen the housing crisis in our state. Predatory practice is common. The only way to stop such practices in the future is this 3% cap. I grew up in St. Paul. My family has faced displacement multiple times due to rent hikes. I think a situation where both sides have issues and concerns, none of which um, should overturn the results of an election. The compelling testimony on the part of, of uh, the folks who are opposed to this, there's compelling testimony on the, on the folks that are in favor of this bill. And um, uh, I think that we ought to continue this discussion. We need all hands on deck to build more units. Rent control, as we heard through testimony, hurts our ability as a state to build more units. And a bipartisan and bicameral group of lawmakers voiced support for legislation that would divest Minnesota's pension funds from Russia. This bill demonstrates that we stand with Ukraine and with the free democracies across the world who have a right to exist in peace. My heart is aching not only for the families attempting to flee or the brave Ukrainians fighting for their home, but also for my Ukrainian American neighbors, of which we are so fortunate to have so many in Northeast Minneapolis. Since the renewed aggression of the Russian Federation, my friends and co-workers have been asking me how I'm doing. I want to use my Minnesota nice answer and say I'm fine, but I'm not. Um, Honestly, I can barely function. My community is deeply rooted in the rich cultural traditions of the Ukrainian people. The food, the music, the dancing, and the intricately, intricately designed Easter eggs. This is an important message that we can send to the world, that we can send to other Minnesotans, that we will not want to profit uh, off of his, his warmongering, and that we do not want to have a formalized relationship with this uh, as Minnesotans and as legislators. And uh, to follow up on Senator Dietzik, Slava Ukraini. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, Thanks for watching.